let me pray for us as we go to God's word. Our loving Father, we ask that you would uh, send your spirit that we may hear your voice in your word this morning. Uh, May we uh, not forget who we once were, uh, but Lord, may we worship you uh, who reconciles us uh, to one another and to yourself. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11, going to the end of the chapter, page 1175. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is the, the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to, to those who were near, for through him, We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Well, our world, as we look around it, is a divided place, isn't it? Uh, What would you give to fix every division, heal every painful separation? If you could, how much would you pay? Uh, John Lennon wrote Imagine in the 1970s. The song contains these lines. Imagine there's no countries. It's, it isn't hard to do. Uh, nothing to kill or die for and no religion to. Imagine all the people living in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. It's a nice song. It's a nice dream. And every person living as one. It's lovely. But John Lennon, he had to call the title Imagine. Because it is a dreamer. He had to call the song Imagine because our world has not become one. Our world is not a place that is living in peace. And so you could be here this morning, Sunday at church, thinking what on earth has the church got to offer the world? What can it offer you? You could be here this morning feeling very painfully the divisions that maybe society has or maybe that you feel yourself within the church. You could be hurting because of them. You find yourself a Christian, but you look at the world, all of its pain and division, and you think, how can we share the good news of Jesus into this divided and painful world? Does Jesus have anything to say to this mess? Well, let's look at what his word says this morning. We're back in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, 11 to 22. Uh, Paul so far has been praising God for his wonderful blessings that he gives. The wonderful blessings that as Christians we have received. He's been praying that the Ephesian Christians would know and love Jesus and one another more. And immediately before this, in chapter 2, Paul has explained how the death and resurrection of Jesus reconciles us 
sinful humans to God, the holy God. Where once we were all cut off from him, dead in our sins, we have been forgiven, brought to life, into relationship with God. This is the radical change between humanity with God. And that is a radical change that has gospel causes, the cross causing this radical reconciliation. Today, though, it's the reconciliation between one another. Uh, Paul is speaking into a divided context and shows that the gospel brings forth one reconciled people. So the reconciliation between God and humanity brings reconciliation to one another. And so he begins by instructing them to remember. Remember what you once were. Remember the before before they have come to faith in Jesus. And Paul explains our old divisions. Now look with me at verse 11. And therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. And Paul is saying, you Gentiles, you people who, who aren't from a Jewish background, you were once called the uncircumcision by those called the circumcision. Essentially, this was one of the great divisions in the ancient world. Uh, Paul admits in his letter to the Philippians that he was once proud to be circumcised. Philippians 3, 5 to 7. Strange thing to be proud of given that he had nothing to do with having his foreskin cut off as a baby. But that's what he was proud of. It was one of the great divisions of the world. But then in Philippians, he says he counts it as loss compared to knowing Christ. In his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul says, Neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 7, 18 to 19. This was to continue the traditional understanding of circumcision, that it was only ever a sign that you were part of God's people. It didn't do anything spiritually before God for you, uh, but it showed that you were part of God's people if you had true faith and you were following God. That's why in Deuteronomy chapter 10, that we read earlier, we see God's people are told to circumcise their hearts and no longer be stubborn. A circumcision didn't save you, faith did, the circumcised heart. Likewise, we baptize infants today. The baptism doesn't save them, but faith does. And so they receive a sign of belonging to the family of God. But all of this had got distorted. All of it had got distorted. The circumcision had become a sign that you could look down on the uncircumcised, on the Gentiles. You could exclude them. You could hate them even. The effects of the uncircumcision that outlined in verse 12. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of the promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. Separated from Christ. If you weren't Jewish in uh, that day, then the messianic title Christ, meaning saviour, it wouldn't have meant that much to you. And given that uh, Jesus' very first followers were Jewish, it makes sense that uh, Paul would describe the Gentiles as separated from Christ. Before knowing Christ, you were separated from him. You didn't know him as saviour. Remember, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were outside of God's chosen people. No inheritance in the land, no benefits of being called part of God's people. And you were looked down upon because of it. It's sort of like the, the dwarves and the elves of Lord of the Rings, hating each other, looking down on one another, suspicious of one another, not sharing wealth, resources or knowledge, alienating one another. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. The Jewish people were direct descendants from Abraham, who God made that promise with. 
the covenantal promise. And this was a point of pride for the Jewish people. God's chosen people. Forgetting, of course, that God's promise to Abraham was that through him, all nations would be blessed. The divisions between Jew and Gentile in this time period were so extreme that if you were Jewish, you weren't allowed to help a Gentile woman when she was in labor because you might accidentally bring a new Gentile into the world. It had become tradition that if you were a Jewish family, you would uh, say Kaddish, uh, a funeral prayer for your child if they married a Gentile. So Paul is saying, remember, this is what the world is like. This is what your world was like. How you guys from the Gentile background, this is how you were viewed. And having no hope. And they didn't know that it was God's plan to save his people. And so, well, many of them were placing their hopes in all sorts of things. Magic, other religions, philosophies, the, the politics of their age. See, Ephesus was a city much like London is today, wealthy, a melting pot of cultures. If you wanted to find somewhere to place your hopes and find meaning, there was any number of people who could sell you a vision of the good life. And they were without God in the world. They were without God in the world. Not that they could put their hands up and say, hey, we're innocent. We didn't even know about God. No, God had revealed himself in the very fabric of our reality. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Like trusting in the gods of their age. Gods like sex and power and money and magic rather than the one true God. Their gods were failing to provide hope, meaning. And so they were without God, without hope. And Paul is saying, remember who you were. Just what a big division there was. You were cut off from God and all his blessings, cut off from his people. And this is essentially the human story, isn't it? Since that first rebellion, we are cut off from God and his people. Uh, Do you realize that if you aren't following God... If you aren't trusting in Christ, then you are cut off from him. You are cut off from his people. Without God, without hope in the world. We might turn around and say, well, I've got plenty of hope, actually. But if it's anywhere other than God, then we are fooling ourselves. Place your hopes in your family and you'll crush them. Place your hopes in your job and you'll be absolutely shaken the moment you're criticised. Place your hopes in making the world a better place and you'll fall into despair. Turn to effective altruism and you'll get the Sam Bankman freed scandal of the last couple of weeks. As Christians, if we follow Paul's instructions and remember who we once were, how does it change our interactions with one another, our relationships across class, race, education. We have no reason to look down on one another at all. But because we were all once in that category of without God, without hope in the world, and needing a rescue. And just as the pivotal moment in the previous section is verse 4, where Paul says, but God. When Paul explains how Jesus reconciled us to the Father. And so Paul now transitions. Look down at verse 13 with me. Verse 13, but now. But now. This is what life once was like for you. But now. Jesus transforms everything. There has been a dramatic change. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This means that the death of Jesus Christ reconciled us to God 
and to one another. The sacrificial blood offered for Jew and Gentile alike means that we're right with God. Our sins paid for on the cross, all the blessings, benefits, newness of that is shared among his people. Being cut off, alienated strangers means we were far off, but the blood of Jesus means we were brought near. I saw uh, a friend performed last night in Handel's Messiah. He's a professional musician, or they were all professional musicians. Their ability is what qualifies them to be part of that choir, brings them together in their different parts to create a, a wonderful sound. After the show, the conductor sort of turns around and he's thanking everybody after they've done all their bowing. And he says, you know what, wouldn't it be fun if we all stood up and sung the Hallelujah Chorus together, Handel's Messiah? And so he turns around, gets the whole crowd to stand up, and uh, we're singing Handel's Messiah together, the Hallelujah Chorus. And I'm thinking, that was pretty easy. Maybe I could become a professional musician. Then, of course, I spoke to my friend afterwards, and I was like, what was it like to have that crowd singing that wonderful music back to you? And he was like, kind of like a football chant. <laughs> my lack of ability disqualifies me from being part of that professional musical choir. Our lack of ability to bring us to God disqualifies us from being reconciled to him. We need the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial blood to bring us together and to bring us to God. It's Christ's blood that brings us near to God and each other. More than that, verse 14, we see Jesus changing absolutely everything, a reversal of what things were like. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Where there was Jew and Gentile and complete separation, they've now been made one. Now, this isn't just a mashing together of everyone. Forget about your differences, guys. It's not following the John Lennon guide for, for church unity. Instead, it's a creation of a new people, a, a new humanity in Christ. The dividing wall is gone. Essentially, a third group created out of people on either side. The unifying factor being that Jesus is our peace. He tore down the dividing wall of hostility, verse 14, in his flesh. What does this mean? Well, you see, the law that the people of God followed was one of the big divisions in the ancient world. So not only did it involve uh, circumcision and all the cultural aspects of that, but it was all of the purity laws, all of the laws of worship. And so, to the outside, to the Gentiles, this was, you know, weird, strange and exclusive. Literally a dividing wall in the temple where Gentiles were no longer allowed to enter in. And to the Jews, the Gentiles were unclean, impure, uh, dirty people who would taint them. Best not to spend too much time with them at all. But Christ has broken down this hostility by fulfillment of the law. In fact, Paul says, verse 15, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace. You know, when uh, Julius Caesar invaded the uh, south coast of Britain in 55 BC, he met uh, resistance from warring Celtic tribes. Uh, but a century later, Roman control had extended all the way north uh, into what is now Scotland. The conquest took like 30,000 Celtic lives, but the Roman victory was short-lived. Surviving clansmen began a fierce guerrilla campaign against their occupiers. So in AD 122, Emperor Hadrian ordered a wall constructed to separate Romans from the barbarians of the north. The wall obviously no longer serves this purpose. Peace with the Celts has been made. And a new people, a united kingdom, means that the wall of hostility is gone. 
It's like that. But between Jews and Gentiles spiritually, because Jesus himself has fulfilled the dividing law. The ceremonial law is no longer required. It was needed in order to worship, to come into God's presence. But Jesus' blood brought us near. So the law no longer produces inequality before God. And the new humanity united to Christ means that all inequality before God is gone. It's what Paul talks about in Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. It's not that God got rid of physical differences, but inequality before God is gone. Why? Because not only has Christ reconciled us to one another in himself, but he's reconciled us to God. Look at verse 16 with me. He might reconcile, might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. What happened on the cross? Our sin that makes us hostile to God was placed on Jesus and killed with him. That means the hostility between us and God was killed as well. And so if we are in Christ, we are reconciled to God. So if you want a Christian here today and you're wondering if you could be right with God, well, it is through Christ. If you're wondering what community the church might offer, it's one that is reconciled with one another and God through Christ. And that's what Jesus did. Next, we see what he preached. He preached peace, verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near, far and near, Jew and Gentile. And peace in the New Testament has a few different uses. It's peace as a, a state, peace with God, the gospel of peace. Here it's even as if Paul is referring to Jesus saying, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Or saying, a peace to you when he appeared to his disciples as the resurrected Christ. And it's this gospel of peace, peace that we preach today. In Acts chapter 1, Luke writes, in the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Uh, began to do and teach. So how is it that Jesus preaches peace today? Well, it's through his people. The whole book of Acts is Jesus' people sharing the peace of Christ with this world. And we continue to do that. He continues to work for us. Not only peace, but also access. Verse 17, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. You see, the whole trinity of God, triune God, is at work in bringing us to relationship with himself access to the Father through the Son in one spirit. And Paul here says that we both, Jews and Gentile, where once it was thought that only Jews had access, now you and I, Gentiles, can access God. Once you were without God in the world, now because of the work of God, you have access to him. So Jesus has completely changed everything. Once Gentiles were the uncircumcision, separate from Christ, alienated from Israel, strangers to the covenant, no hope without God. But Jesus just changed everything. Bringing us near, making us one, reconciling us to God, giving us peace and access. And Paul now expands on uh, who we are as this new humanity. The rest of the book of Ephesians, spoilers for what's coming ahead, is basically instructions on how to live as this new humanity. The final verses in this chapter give us a, a vivid illustration. We're a new people, a new family, and a new temple. Verse 18, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You, as a new humanity, are also a new people, as citizens of a new place. Imagine if, when the Berlin Wall had come down, immediately East and West Germany became United Germany, brand new country, every citizen a citizen of a new place with all the benefits of being one united nation. 
Paul is saying to the church, don't let the divisions of this world separate you. You are a new people. It can be hard to live like this, can't it? Uh, we look round at those who sit in church with us, all works of life, all nations represented. Uh, there are many in our world today who uh, focus purely on how we are different, that our lived experiences of our differences should shape all of our interactions. Paul isn't ignoring these differences. He's simply saying that what defines our relationship is the Lord Jesus reconciling us to one another, making us a new people. So if you have Christ as Lord here today, this morning, you have more in common with every Christian than you do with anyone who does not follow Christ. No longer strangers separated, but instead a new people, a new family. We're formed into a new family. That's what Paul means when he says we're members of the household of God. He means a new family. Uh, these words, uh, family and household, are uh, somewhat interchangeable, aren't they? Your, your family, your entire household would have got baptised uh, when you came to believe, including your household st staff and your kids, etc. And so every Christian is your brother and sister because you're part of the new family. How does this change how you interact with one another? How does this change how you do friendships? How you forgive? How you love? Have you considered that being a new family means that you have God as your father? You're part of his household. Think about uh, what qualifies Prince Louis to come out onto the royal balcony during celebrations and events. Even though he's pulling faces and messing around, what qualifies him? It's his family, his father. He can run up to King Charles III and sit on his knee. And can you imagine how Louis will deal with facing criticisms or struggles or difficulties the resources that he can draw upon and go to. Well, we are a new family. God is our father. This changes so much for us. And Paul then finishes this section by changing the metaphor up slightly. Uh, he shows that we are built into a new temple. Now, verse 20, uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself becomes the cornerstone being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. If you walk past uh, any of the construction sites around this area, uh, what is always the, the first step to building the high rises? It's those crazy deep foundations get dug. Because the towers, they need to not fall over when storms hit. The foundations have to be completely firm. The apostles, Jesus' first followers, and prophets are the firm foundation of the church. When we see, say the creeds together, we affirm that we call the church Catholic and apostolic, meaning that are we as Christians, united to every Christian throughout time and all over the world, who hold to the faith as passed on by the apostles. The cornerstone of the foundation, the most important piece, the, the first to go into the building, is Jesus Christ. The practical implication of this is that this is the foundation of our unity. We cannot be united to those who do not have Jesus and the apostolic faith as their foundation. It would be like being part of a choir and deciding rather than following the sheet music, breaking out into your own rap song or something. It just wouldn't work. And Paul continues, if we're in him, then verse 21, we're being joined together. Together we become a temple, a built together, a dwelling place for God. Verse 22, in him you are also built together into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. 
So on the foundations, the firm foundations of the apostles, the prophets, at Jesus as the cornerstone, we are being built into a new temple. A question for you then, why is it that Paul decides to change this metaphor, to to use this metaphor of a temple rather than uh, elsewhere he's used a body? Why temple here? Elsewhere, when he talks about believers being one united group, he calls them the body of Christ. Why does he use a temple? The answer lies in what the temple was for. The temple was where God would dwell by his spirit and meet with his people. The Old Testament temple was where God would meet with his spirit, in fact, uh, meet with his sinful people. In fact, uh, the temple is described with the same language that the Garden of Eden is described with. It's where God and humanity dwelt together. His presence, though, left the temple. Remember, we looked at that in the book of Ezekiel. The rebuilt temple, God's glory never moved back in because of sinful humanity. Fast forward to Jesus' day. He describes his body as a temple because he is God and humanity meeting in perfect union. He describes his death and resurrection as the temple being destroyed and rebuilt in three days. So what does it mean then that we ourselves are being built as a temple in which the spirit of God is to dwell? It means that today God meets humanity in his church, his people where his spirit dwells, where his presence is. And practically, this means that uh, there's no such thing as lone ranger, lone wolf Christianity, doesn't it? If you're uh, not meeting with God's people, um, then uh, you're not actually showing that you have the spirit of God with you. Uh, This doesn't mean uh, tick a box and come to church on a Sunday, arrive in the first song, leave in the last one have no other involvement, in what way would that be being built together? No, this is a real commitment. I walk along the Thames path at low tide, and what do you see? You see all sorts of bricks on, uh, in the mud, uh, loads of them. And these bricks are serving absolutely no purpose. They're on their own. They're, they're supposed to be a wall. They're supposed to be built up with other bricks on firm foundations. But instead, they're sitting there uselessly stuck in the mud, And many of them are being eroded by the time, tide and storms. The Christian life is being temple bricks, not Thames bricks. We're built together that the Spirit of God may dwell in us. God may meet his people. So Paul is speaking to a divided world and church. A world much like our own. But he shows that God was willing to give himself in Christ, that we might be reconciled to him and to one another. He doesn't simply go the John Lennon route and say, imagine we have no differences, but instead shows how Christ overcomes our divisions by forming us into a new people, a new family, and a new new temple where his spirit dwells and he meets with his people. In just a moment, we'll continue our service in prayer. But take a moment and just in the quiet of your heart, ask God's Spirit uh, to help you to apply this into uh, your week.